Welcome everyone to this session. My name is Marie Ringler. I am with the organization Ashoka that you've heard a little bit about already today. And I think those of you who were at the opening session saw a small video of our founder, Bill Drayton. There is a very strong and long-standing friendship and partnership between Ashoka and Zero Project, so I'm very pleased to be able to facilitate this conversation today. This session will have a slightly different format to many of the sessions um, at conferences because we have asked four leaders in the field of technology and accessibility to present and pitch their work. And we've invited four leaders in the world of business to give feedback. Now, we also want to make sure we capture everyone else's feedback. Because we're such a big group, we actually won't have time to um, hear everyone's voices in the room but we're distributing cards, feedback cards. Um, my wonderful assistant Lev will uh, hand you a card if you're interested that will allow you to also uh, feedback to our presenters. And with that, I would like to present to you our four, we call them panelists, four leaders in the field of technology and accessibility and working in the corporate world, <laughs> whose voices we will hear as feedbackers. Let me start with Hector Minto. Hector, please stand up so people see you. Hector is Senior Technology Evangelist at Microsoft in the field of assistive technologies, alternative communication, and special educational needs. He's also worked uh, with the UK government and has led projects on gesture technology, eye tracking, and home automation. Welcome, Hector. Thank you for being here. Francis. Francis West is the founder of Francis West Co., a company providing strategic digital inclusion and accessibility technology, and comes from being IBM's first chief accessibility officer. She's also the chair of the strategy and development committee of the G3 ICT a UN-affiliated organization focused on IT inclusion. Thank you, Francis, for being with us. And then we have Dimitri Kanevsky. Uh, Dimitri started his career at Google uh, working on speech recognition algorithms <laughs> for YouTube. And I will say I'm deeply impressed by the fact that he himself holds 274 patents. And then we have the honor also to welcome Jake Abba from ING. He is accessibility lead at ING Netherlands and has been working to set up a raft of initiatives of products and services that the bank offers its clients and makes sure that they're accessible to people with the widest range of capabilities. So please welcome these leaders in the field of business. Um, I especially adore your titles. I think they're the most creative that we've heard about um, today. So. That's clearly a sign of hopefully some fun and interesting conversations that we will have in this session. How this session will work is that um, Zero Project has invited four solutions in the field of IT and accessibility. And we've asked these four solutions to share 
um, their work with us in a very short four to maximum five minute pitch. And then we're asking our business leaders to share their thoughts, input, feedback, and advice. And while that's happening, do make use of the fact that you have this neat little sheet in front of you called your feedback card. And add your thoughts and input. Because, you know, um, in a rapidly changing world, um, the more feedback and input we get, the better. And with this, I would like to ask Michael Milligan to start us off in the presentations. Michael, would you like to come here? I think there is a clicker available for your presentations. And Michael is the Secretary General of the Mobile and Wireless Forum, and he is responsible for, global, for coordinating its global activities in the field of research support, standards development, and regulatory affairs. Michael, your five minutes start now. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to everyone for your attendance and participation at this great conference and great event. I'm going to speak to you today about the Global Accessibility Reporting Initiative. It's a project that we've been running now um, for a few years within the Mobile and Wireless Forum, uh, and it addresses one of the central issues, uh, the most common experiences that people have, and that is the absence of awareness of the type of features that these great technologies and devices that we have around us every day what those features are that, that each device is actually supporting and how to find that information. Um, it's obviously, I'm sure many of you will, will be familiar with that challenge that even within the marketing departments of all of our major companies, there's <clears throat> certain features which are really well pr uh, presented and, and promoted, but uh, there's a lot of accessibility features built into these products which um, are difficult for people to actually find out about. So Gari tries to address this by providing a central global database for uh, manufacturers of a range of devices to present this information to, to the public. As you can see here from the website um, page, uh, we cover a range of products today, mobile phones, tablets, smart TVs, uh, wearable devices, and accessibility-related apps. The Gari website uh, is presented in a way that allows consumers to either search by a particular category, to search by a particular manufacturer, or to enter into a far more detailed search in order to find a product that best suits their particular needs. It does this, uh, and for instance, in this particular instance, if you are requiring um, the need for a speech uh, screen reader within the device, uh, you'd be able to click on that and find devices that will have that, or some sort of magnifier, or in fact a um, uh, a speech recognition or uh, a speech feature related to the device. And once you've made those selections of the, uh, of the different features, you can learn a little bit more about them and then the website will then give you a list um, of the devices which, which have those particular features that you are after. The most important thing is that uh, this is only one way to present the data and we actually make and share the actual raw data set available as an XML feed to organisations and governments around the world so that they can use the same data that's provided by the manufacturers uh, and they can present it in their own way that best seats, suits their particular constituents, uh, needs, uh, whether you be a, an organisation that represents peoples with disabilities or if you're a government agency that uh, is, is looking to inform the public. So what's the value proposition? Well, of course, for consumers, it's to help um, find the product that best suits their needs. For manufacturers, it's about providing an opportunity to ensure compliance in one place at one time. Uh, for governments, it's about basically providing, ensuring that their information requirements are being met and that their publics are being well served with information about the accessibility features within devices. And for network operators, it's about also 
providing them with a better overview of the accessibility features within their product portfolios and that they can then in turn use this same information to better serve their customers both at a retail level, through their call centres or on their websites. <clears throat> and so what is the roadmap for Gari then? Well, we basically want to um, obviously expand the range of products and services that we're able to provide uh, reports on. Uh, we want to um, encourage more stakeholders to participate in the program uh, and to become involved and ultimately to become a single uh, source for accessibility information within ICT products globally. With that, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity and I welcome any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for your time discipline. <laughs> With that, I invite our business leaders to comment, ask questions, give advice, share their input and thoughts. Who would like to start? OK, great. Thank you. Just press the button, and that will start your microphone. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. That was really, really, really excellent. And actually, uh, it's a topic that companies like Microsoft, Google have to have to look at, you know, how do we how do we make sure that people are realizing the features that are built into their systems uh, without going through to specialist assistive technology, you know, sh should they be using the features that are already built into their systems. Um, one of the one of the challenges I think you'll face, and I just want to know how, where you're thinking about this, is that quite often it's the app ecosystem that delivers the accessibility as opposed to the, so the, the, uh, the app is available on a certain handset or a certain operating system and not on others. Are you, how are you going to handle that and specifically how are you going to handle that globally? Thank you. Um, I think we'll collect maybe two questions and then, yeah, wonderful. Any other thoughts or input from... Um, so, Michael, from my understanding is that this is really one way of introducing the consumers to make their access to this information more easily. Okay. Um, I was just saying that uh, the intent of this project is to really make the information more readily accessible to consumers. Um, in the... Um, I mean, the consumer could still be overwhelmed by a lot of information and also depends on the uh, persona. Like, for example, if you're a young person, millennial versus an aging person, um, I wonder if there are any thought of, for example, creating more of a, what I call a default persona. So I come in, I can say I'm over age 50, I click on the persona, it actually gives me some recommended uh, product you know, uh, and that to simplify potentially the navigation through the uh, product roadmap. Do you want to react to that, Michael? Do you have some thoughts? Please move the microphone very close. Okay. The more close you move your microphone, the better everyone in the room hears you. Okay, I hope that's uh, suitably close. Excellent, thank you for those questions. Just first of all, I'll deal with the question of the apps. So the apps are actually a category that we have uh, within the Gari website. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, more than 400 accessibility-related apps that are featured there. Uh, and we recognise that you know, some of those apps are critical to people's uh, use every day. And so obviously, that's all part of the purchasing decision uh, of when you're thinking about maybe updating your product is that you want to be confident that that particular app uh, that is going to be able to work for you on your new device. So <clears throat> we already incorporate that within the database, that information about the apps. We allow people th to then find um, the uh, devices that work with those apps. Uh, and then you can do the reverse uh, search up as well. So you can find a device and find out what accessibility apps are available for it, or you can look up your particular app and find out which of the newer models are going to be working with that app. So that's very much included, and uh, uh, I think within the app universe that's important to recognise, but also before in the actual devices themselves, the manufacturers, participating manufacturers, are reporting on about 110 different features within the devices. So we want to make sure that we're trying to present a, as comprehensive a picture as possible on, on the accessibility of the devices. And to Francis's question, um, yes, I think that's, that, that's an excellent um, suggestion. 
although it was very, very brief, uh, the first option that people have when they come and visit the site is they can actually have a look for at least by category. So if you are uh, new to this and you just uh, uh, are interested in devices which might help you to hear better, you can just select the hearing feature, the category, and it will show you the devices which are, uh, have the most number of features relating to hearing. But yes, certainly it's something, because one of the other audiences within this are people um, that are actually maybe helping those with disabilities, or in fact, uh, you know, I'm sure as many of us in the room, including myself, who have tried to help my elderly parents find a new device. And so we, we, we're also catering for that, uh, for that audience as well. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dimitri, yes, please. There is an one way to find answer for any question. Google. <laughs> and so if I want to find out what accessibility feature I need, where to find, put it in Google. Somebody already found answer. So maybe this also can be used by your company. Just Google for all answers and make short summary. You can use a machine learning for this. It can make for you automatically find answers and make a good tutorial for others. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, how about we just yeah. ask Jake whether he also has some thoughts and then collect that again. Um, and we have about two more minutes. <laughs> I'll try to make it fast. I have a lot of questions, but the, the, the main question Can is... Can you please move your microphone? The people you're aiming at, uh, those are the people who are in need of assistive technology. So um, how do you, um, how do those consumers find your product and in which way are they helped to complete the whole process of filling in the form? Uh, because there's a lot of, of course a lot of technical terms behind it and uh, there's a lot of information behind it and uh, the core principle of those people is that they, they already are in need when they find your product. So um, how do you close that gap? Thank you. Michael, you have about a minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, an excellent question, Jake, thank you. Uh, so I think that the core to answering that question is to recognise that we present the data in one way, but we, what we do is actually try to partner with organisations through allowing everyone to have access to the raw data, the, the XML file in the database, so that they can present the information that will best address um, their customers' needs or constituents' needs. So um, I think that's, that's the best way that we can, we can work with, with others to try to improve the presentation of the information and to help them, um, you know, to be able to find a product uh, easier and quicker. Because they may not actually that be that familiar with the Gari website, but they may be familiar with their with their operator, uh, the, the national operator. It's more likely that they're going to be available of where that of those. <clears throat> and so, providing that information through the operator is is probably a much more effective way. But yeah, it's so recognizing that we can we want to present the information in as in as easy a format as possible for as many people. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And so now we're moving to the next presentation and a big applause to Michael, please. Our next presentation um, is by Boa Silberman um, of Project Ray. He is the co-founder and CEO of Project Ray, a company providing the first smartphones specially developed for use by blind and visually impaired people. Boas. Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Boaz from Project Ray. And uh, uh, our uh, elevator pitch of what we do is very simple. We make smartphones accessible for visually impaired people. 
But the real uh, two words that are uh, written over there, elderly people, is a differentiation between what we do and others. Uh, our, uh, in our attempt, we believe that uh, the standard accessibility that is available uh, in smartphone today really address the needs and capabilities of minority of the people, about 10, 20 percent of those who uh, are advocates of the blind and uh, those who de uh, define and push for design for all. Uh, the uh, 80 percent of the blind people, which are elderly people that lost their sight at a later age, suffer from sight and cognitive problems that prevent from most of them to effectively use smartphone and actually get the benefit of it. And this is exactly uh, the target market of the people that we would are tr uh, uh, trying to address with our uh, special uh, product. Uh, we are from Israel, and in Israel we managed to get to about 20% market share uh, uh, of people that are 60 and more and above uh, in, in age, and they are using smartphone with smartphone capabilities, not all of the application, but a very specific range of capabilities, and they become uh, digitally literate and uh, can actually use the digital benefits of smartphone and online uh, connectivity. Only two uh, uh, items that I would like to mention is a killer application. Uh, WhatsApp uh, is turned to be the killer application in our, in our uh, suite of capabilities for uh, uh, end users. This is a de facto communication network uh, in Israel and uh, uh, in Europe uh, especially. And the joy that uh, I can see in elderly person that is exchanging his first uh, uh, WhatsApp message, usually with grand grandchild or granddaughter, uh, is really something to look at. Uh, the other feature that is important and a uh, uh, killer is for caregiver and family member, and this is the remote support capabilities that are built into the product and enable people to manage the device and download and load content on, uh, on it uh, remotely over the web. Now, uh, doing it, uh, the real difficulty beside the technology, and by the way, uh, to make things very uh, easy is very, very, very difficult. Uh, we don't have 270 patents, but we have seven patents around what we have done uh, in this uh, product, and roughly 30 months here of development to build the entire platform. To make it happen, we really require and, uh, uh, and got help from a, a lot of people and a lot of organizations, starting with the Association for the Blind in Israel and abroad, going into financial from the Israeli government. One of the reasons that you will see a lot of Israeli companies is a, a sponsorship for accessibility by the government bodies and by companies like Qualcomm, and I am happy that I put the logo of Google and Microsoft, so it was a but really we got help from all of those companies. But the most important thing, and this is really the key message that I, want, I would like to deliver in here, is the, a, a, a group of uh, logos on the right side, which represent the Israeli mobile carriers and the landland carrier, that all of them actually guide, have gone beyond the standard accessibility, and they buy the product from us and give it away for free for the visually impaired, for the visually impaired customers in return for very extensive and one-on-one -on -one support and training that we are giving to those users in order to enable them to use and effectively benefit from uh, smartphones. And in, uh, uh, because time is running out, uh, I will invite uh, another uh, uh, question from the members about those stickers on the, uh, uh, in the graph. And really, my, my, my requ our request and our goal is to try to bring as many carriers and mobile uh, uh, players into this area because we believe that they are responsible to educate and to make smartphone available for people with disabilities. Thank, Thank you, you. Boas. <laughs> Jake, would you like to start by yes. asking what the buttons are? 
Um, yes, this is on. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I already made some assumptions, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's a smartphone uh, specifically for the blind and officially impaired. And uh, I, I was just wondering, is it, is, is it built on the operating systems as we know, like iOS and Android? And I know that even the big companies have a real hard time getting up with all the new standards. So if you build like a layer on top of it, um, how do you uh, how, how do you see the updates for that specific new technologies um, and um, specifically um, um, uh, sp yeah specifically uh, how you uh, how, how you keep up to speed with all the with all the the, 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 the new standards of the fight so. Dimitri would you like to ask a second question? You just need to press the button, please. Thank you. My second question, can it be extended to smart watches? Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, without explicit, explicitly asking about the buttons, practically both of you ask about it. So this is a key element. Uh, uh, we really div uh, provide application. So just like any other application, by the way, it's working only on Android because on iPhone I can't do what I do, but on Android it's application that is working just like any download application on the, on the phone. Now, on top of it, uh, we provide those, those are the stickers that you saw, the buttons. Those are physical buttons that are uh, uh, basic, based on NFC radio and with four keys, to go up, down, enter and back, we enable blind user to have a tactile interface and to control the entire set of capabilities in our system. So practically we are talking about people that are coming with an, a leftover device from family member. They bring their old Android phone, they download the application. This is the only way to work with mobile operators, basically to give them something that they don't have to put a line item and so on. So it's regular Android phone, even third generation uh, beyond, left over. You download the application, you can add the buttons and continue and actually control with tactile interface the entire device. Now, when you ask about a clock, the new version that we are working is those, this, which is a Bluetooth-based keypad, if you would like. Uh, this can be, it's right, right now in the prototype, but our idea is that this can be sticked on the walking stick of a, a visual impaired person or even attached to the sleeves and actually provide a, a control over the phone while it is tucked away in the, in the pocket and uh, uh, provide you with the one free end that you need uh, instead of holding the phone while you walk. Hector, I saw you were thinking. So if, I, if you allow me to be blunt, <laughs> uh, when you started I was sitting there worrying, uh, if I'm honest, that we're taking people with disabilities towards another generation of specialist solutions. Uh, and that really always concerns me. It, it, mm -hmm. it does two things. It keeps you kind of locked in specialist schemes to provide those systems and it actually stops the mainstream manufacturers from supporting true innovation and going global. So, so but uh, you've then rescued it <laughs> because I actually look at the buttons on the back of the handset and I, and I would use those. I can imagine, you know, that, that's, a, that's an add-on to a mobile phone that would allow me to maybe do something while I was driving, or I'm not going to say driving, but, but you, know, driving you know, using a touch beam while you're doing something else. I know, I know. <laughs> okay, uh, is, a, is a problem, right? So, so it's like, so you have, you have elements of inclusive design there for something that could be, you know, another thing from the disability world that the mainstream loves, mm -hmm. which right. I'm really impressed with. Wonderful. Thank Francis. You. Yeah, I was actually thinking about um, what is the value proposition to the carrier um, for adopting your technology? Um, is it, in this case, allow them to go after a, a new customer set that historically probably would not be using the, the smartphone and therefore 
generate additional usage or uh, customer retention. So could you talk to that? Okay, so those are two different. I will start with you and the carrier. Uh, I have to, to say uh, for the carrier, we bring new customers because uh, the alternative that our uh, customers have is to stay with the old feature phones, usually with no uh, 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 mobile package, uh, only to receive calls and so on. So practically we bring new customers, but the numbers are so little, so small, that it is not significant. I think that really what we brought to the uh, carrier, first of all, is the op opportunity to do good, which is important. And the other thing is that we take care of the support and training of the end user. So it's really part of the education and responsibility, social responsibility that they have as people that operate and actually run the digital uh, economy of today. Is that remote support, is that a fee service or it's a free service from the carrier? Uh, uh, the uh, fee that we get from the carrier is or let's put it this way, our struct fee structure is to sell the support and the product for uh, uh, less than $10 a month. It means it's another hidden agenda behind, uh, that we have to provide something that is very affordable. So basically, the $10 are part of the uh, uh, package. monthly package okay. fee of the carrier. Okay. And uh, as for you, uh, Hector, uh, um, I, I can tell you that for the last three years I struggled between design for all and something specific uh, because I do believe that design for all is a way to go, but I think that by doing it you really ignore a large segment of the community because there are people that need something special. Now, saying this, uh, we really develop something that moves between actually uh, create a boundary or a, a, a bridge between the special and the uh, everything. And a uh, part of our capabilities in the system is to invoke standard Android application or even to go out to Android and actually use it as a smartphone. And uh, I, I have to admit that uh, I want customers to be repeated customers, but I am very happy if customer, if somebody will use my system to get a custom to a smartphone and his next phone or next next phone will be a standard of the shelf using standard accessibility. This will be a pride as well. Thank you, Boas. A big applause. <laughs> and I can already see that there is a continued conversation between Hector and Boas <laughs> that will happen around this very important topic. And with this, we're going to our third presenter, uh, Carmine D'Antuono, who is from LVE Systems, um, creating a tactile path that talks through a mobile phone. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to everyone for this great opportunity to share with you our technology. Um, as you can see from our presentation, um, LVE system is a, a tactile paving system that uh, allows not only to have um, tactile information, but also vocal information through uh, the use of several elements. First of all, we have uh, a tactile uh, paving, which is uh, a normal used profile we produce ourselves. It's made of a special kind of high resilience PVC. It's fireproof, very resistant, indoor and outdoors. Plus, there is an integration of this tactile pavement with uh, radio frequency tags. These tags communicate with uh, a smartphone, uh, I'm sorry, a smart Bluetooth stick uh, that is produced by our company. And uh, uh, this stick communicates with the smartphone, giving him the indication of the position of the person on the path. And uh, uh, there is a, a developed app available for uh, Android and iOS. Um, that uh, communicate through a headset um, the message that has been set uh, previously set on the map. And of course, all these maps are certified, 
test approved and put on a European database, our database that uh, doesn't allow anybody to, uh, let's say, modify the, modify the map, which is very important. Once the person, the visually impaired or blind person is on the place, he download the app, download the maps, and there is no more need for internet connection. So the uh, map is on the smartphone. This is, uh, let's say, a small um, drawing on how it works. You see the pavement, the radio frequency tra uh, ground tags, they communicate with the sticks and then with the smartphone and the app and to the, uh, going to the person, to the uh, visually impaired people. LVS system, as I, as I said, is produced by our company, JKJ, an Italian company that specialized in the production of this kind of PVC tactile pavement. And of course, um, the profile used is um, uh, in accordance to the European standards. We are working every day on research and uh, both the stick and the app is uh, um, periodically updated. What's very important about LVA system, about the, also the material, not only the software, is that it is very, very easy to be installed. You can install it with a B component glue, very resistant out, outdoor and indoor. Even when the building or the, um, let's say, the place where we have to install the, um, uh, the route is already completed. So there's no problem. It can be easily installed anywhere and uh, um, also installed by uh, a double tape, a special kind of double tape. It works everywhere, under snow, also under water, uh, according to our last tests. Um, and of course, the PVC, um, the PVC pavement can be uh, substituted by cement, grass, any kind of material except for metals, very important. So uh, our target is to create accessible cities. There are a lot of technology that allow you to understand how to get a bus, how to get a taxi uh, out, but, but the real question is how do I get to a bus stop? How do I get to a taxi stop in order to, uh, to be able to, to, to get it? Uh, in Italy, we created, uh, um, um, let's say, Cosenza is one of the uh, biggest examples of uh, 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 accessible city with five kilometers of LVS systems. The same goes with the high-speed station of Naples. The next step is trying to uh, always make more research and to delete also the, the stick, maybe to substitute it with an ankle bracelet that will delete the necessity of using these sticks inside the buildings. Our, uh, um, I'm sorry, our, um, uh, our appeal goes to, of course, association and any kind of person that could, be, uh, could help us to support the product. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. And also thank you for your time discipline. Who wants to start? Dimitri, would you like to start with your thoughts? This is very interesting application, but I'm not sure if I understood how people define location on map if you do not have global position system. If you are on the bridge or in some places where there are no local position system information. Francis, would you like to go next? Again, I was thinking uh, I would be interested to in know what, what was the motivation uh, for creating both the device, the stick, and then also the material. There seems to be a lot of R&D has to gone into it. And how did you justify the investment versus the return, you know, from a business case standpoint? 
Okay, um, I will answer uh, to Mr. Kanevsky first. Uh, how do I know where the system are available? So, uh, our application allow you to find all the maps available. According to a name, you can insert the name. For example, there is a route here on the first floor, and uh, if you download the app and write zero project, you will find the route in zero project. You would see where it is. Otherwise, you can uh, search for uh, all the, the patterns, the route, in a radius of one kilometers, 10, 11, uh, 1,000, and so on kilometers. So you will see all the paths available. Um, how do I justify a lot of hardware, let's say? Well, uh, the problem is to get the information actually not the information because it is in a European database, but the real position. I need, the person need to know exactly where it is. And uh, that's very important because on the route, the, the, the LVA system can also tell you if you change direction. The message must be very precise. The uh, position must be very precise. I understand it's a lot of hardware. We are trying to work on research about that uh, by developing an ankle bracelet that will be, uh, you know, attached to my legs. So there will be no need for this. But this is something to come, let's say. Thank you. Hector, would you like to go next? Please turn on. Um, so is it always connected? Is it always connected on the cloud? Are the sensors always connected? No, it's not. Uh, you download the map, and the map, which is just a, uh, a simple uh, information, very light, is on your smartphone. And in your app, you have a list of the maps available. So the location is, is decided when it's installed? Yeah, when you install the system, that you, you register the, you know, uh, that No, device. no, no. Uh, the location, sorry. sorry oh. I, 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 yeah. I wanted to collect questions, and okay. then Okay, 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 perfect, sorry. I would like to build on top of the question from Hector. I have something the same. Um, also, the map, um, even the map from the navigation in my car is often a little bit wrong. So, um, how do you make sure that people always find their way, especially when streets are broken up or when the map is outdated? So, That's uh, the point first question. Um, I have a map on my uh, smartphone. I uh, set on my GPS and the smartphone sees where I am. In, right? In this case, I put a radius of kilometers. Am I, am I answering your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. When I download the map, the map is on the phone. There's no need for internet. The map is, of course, certified, test, checked. I mean, we did it. I mean, we installed it, so all the messages are on the phone, like we did on the first floor here. And in this case, then you go on, you can go on and use the route as you prefer. Did I answer your question? I'm sorry. Oh, okay, perfect. So, and uh, um, how do I know if something is broken or not? I did it. I mean, uh, we need a lot of partners, distributors, and assistants on the territory in order to install the route properly in order for someone to take the responsibility for the messages. That's what we do with train station, airports, any kind of public spaces, and nobody can touch the database. If you are my partner and you want to modify the map or create a map, because for example, now we are working with Germany, with Sweden, and uh, you have your customers and you are going to present your demo, you are going to modify, to create the demo using uh, a team up, uh, an application which is called team up. But you do yourself. Thank you. Dimitri, one last comment or question. If I would develop this application at IBM many years ago, IBM lawyer would object. He, he would say what happened if someone loses your application and fell in the pond. He cannot. Then uh, they threw IBM and they would not allow me to develop this application. How you avoid this problem? 
Okay, nobody can touch the maps. That's the point. You, they are available on your smartphone. They are checked, tested, but nobody can absolutely touch them using the smartphone app. So there's no access to, to the maps. This is very important, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Carmine. An applause for... And if I may just remind you that there are these little neat feedback cards um, that you can fill out if you have thoughts or advice or ideas to share or are interested in the, uh, in the work more deeply, you can either leave it here at the table or give it to the initiative. You, it's optional if you want to add your name or not. I think it uh, could be very helpful and useful this for our fun. presenters. And with that, we go to the last presentation of this round. Uh, Brian Daniram, Jessica Newen, and Jason Da Silva from AS AXS Lab and AXS Map, a crowdsourced Google Map based platform that rates the accessibility of businesses. Oh, you need the clicker? Sure. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Jason Da Silva. I'm the founder of Access Map. This is Jessica and Brian. And we're here to present you. So unlike the last presentation, people can touch our map. And that's the power of our tool. It's a quantitative database for accessible places all over the world. We make use of Google Places. And we first came about in 2010 with the grant from Google Earth Outreach. Next slide. We're working on the slides. Uh, this presentation is dedic to, dedicated to my grandmother. She just passed away three days ago, and the funeral t is today. But I would not be where I am today without her. So as I said, uh, Access Map is powered by Google Places API. The best way to think about it is like Yelp or uh, uh, another search engine, uh, like a TripAdvisor, for people with disabilities and their supporters to help find places that are accessible around them. <laughs> so these are some of the statistics that we have come up with. We've been here since 2010. So it is resounding what we have. So this is 76,000 users, 150,000 reviews in 200 plus cities. Uh, that third number there is 280 plus mapathons. Now what the Access Mapathon is, is it's a community event that can be launched through the application. It can be set up in less than five minutes. Uh, you can have two people or you can have a thousand people. It's really the, uh, the potential is limitless there. And what these community events are is um, participants split up into teams and compete to rate and review as many locations as possible. Um, and one of the issues that this is addressing for us is how do we incentivize users to collect data for us. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see some testimonials of uh, when we worked with Google through Google Serve um, and Google offices around the world were competing to rate and review as many places as possible. Um, and we've managed to collect uh, a significant amount of our data through these mapathons. Next slide. Keep going. Yep. Try one keep, more time. Just keep going. We've done, really uh, so we've worked with Google Serve. So every May, over 70 offices worldwide compete against each other. Uh, we get close to maybe 50,000 reviews every year because of this. One of our initiatives, uh, initiatives is Access Schools, uh, which is our work with the United Nations. Um, to achieve target goal SDG 4A, which is an inclusive education for all. Um, part of what we're utilizing Access Maps for is diagnosing the accessibility of schools. Um, and Access Mapathons has helped with this as well. Uh, it makes a great community event within schools and school districts. Um, the 
Access Schools initiative uh, in the coming year. We're going to expand from just diagnosing the physical space, uh, the accessibility of physical spaces, to looking into educational curriculums as well, um, and really uh, getting into what makes an accessible education. So now Jason's going to talk a little bit about uh, Accessibility Cloud and our integration with our data there. Thank you. So yeah, we're excited right now. We're about to come up with the next round of XMAP, XMAP 2.0, which will introduce an Access Map API where either tools, similar tools to ours as WheelMap or uh, BMAP, for example, we're just we're one of the first ones, but there's over 10 or 15 maps similar to us, but through the API, we can all work together and through the initiative that Google supported called Accessibility Cloud, we can all work together and uh, put, pull all our data together. So in a way to, to describe that, our database, which is now 200,000 places, moves to 1 million plus places by working together to, to share this data. So uh, this is a heat map of the, we're the premier one in North America. So this is what it looks like within the US. These are all positively rated places on, on the access map. Uh, but we are able to expand this because we are powered by Google places. Uh, we can expand this into other countries. Uh, long story short, we would want to work with you and we need your data. Uh, so quickly, just to wrap up, uh, my name is Jessica, and I work with Jason as the technical manager. A couple projects we're working on, what we're doing with this data, is creating, one, a VR access map where a user can be fully immersed within a location, so that way they can have a qualitative understanding of the location. The next thing that we're doing is, like what Jason has said, with Access Map 2.0, with all the updates of all the data that we have uh, had, we are going to create Project JACE which stands for Journey Assisting Service Enabler. With this hands-free device, a person can navigate in real time to any location that they would like to go to that has the amenities they need. For example, uh, if I had low vision, I could simply ask, hey Jace, where's the nearest coffee shop that has bright lights for me? And we would be able to do that. So with, with, with that said, we're gonna wrap up. We strive for a world that's 100% accessible. And uh, we aim for that. We would love to talk to you. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the team of Access Map. Um, yes, who would like to start with their thoughts and input? Yeah, Jake, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I really liked that people can join to add to this product. And basically, you answered a lot of questions already with your, uh, with your comments on your product. Um, but what I was still wondering is, uh, it, it seems like it's a terrific product, but how do you make sure that this product will also be known at the big travel agencies so people will know they can use this product? Mm -hmm. So maybe we can collect a second question or input. Uh Hector? Um, it's a great presentation. Um, so we often hear about uh, the, you know, the spending power of people with disabilities, so I'm really interested to hear whether businesses that have had good reviews have really noticed a substantial increase in business and sales so that we can present that information back to businesses. Um, the other question I have, just quickly, um, so it obviously takes quite, an, good, quite an effort through your, uh, your mapathons to get a good review and, 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 and sort of substantiate that data but good accessibility is like a is, is often ignorant is just ignorance for a business they, they don't know they're being inaccessible so how quickly can they remedy their accessibility without just being forever branded as an inaccessible business thank you would you well, like to uh, I could uh, start with those two so I'll start with uh, Hector's question so that is really the challenge that we're dealing with 10 years of being around is how can we can we audit and how we can we certify so places are remedied to be accessible. That's the, the stuff they're working on now. And uh, we are coming up with a certification program. So 
when some places it's XMAP certified, they go through an audit auditing process, and then they can be known as Access Map certified or Access Map Platinum, and therefore they would be able to put that on their storefront or have a reward system so that can be done. Uh, and then, Brian, do you want to take the next one? Okay. So I would say, uh, as far as um, interface with travel agencies and making sure that uh, information is getting to them. I think right now one of our main focuses um, has been working through schools and making sure that uh, those places are accessible as well as with local businesses. Um, I think that is probably a direction we can go in as well um, in developing the application. Um, I know working through schools is probably the primary focus that we're going to be taking on uh, in the next year. Um, but as we develop the application, we can uh, continue to look into that as well. It's going to be a uh my, this is one of the big challenges, which everybody is done with, is the promotion and marketing and how we can make this known to everybody. Francis. Actually, I have a question on the, um, on the uh, access lab or a school system. So you were saying that because you survey the school physical infrastructure through your mapathon, that you're now going to evolve into the curriculum assessment, which is really a soft, you know, infrastructure versus a hard infrastructure. Is that my, is my understanding correct? Right. Yeah. And so you you're basically extending into the digital accessibility realm versus the physical accessibility. Yes, that is correct. Um, well, actually, the way this came about was uh, somebody approached us and asked, uh, how does this application work for people with intellectual disabilities? And me and Jason had a long conversation about this that, you know, our primary concern has been physical spaces. Um, and especially, you know, when we start talking about educational curriculums, a lot of this is the soft infrastructure. Um, so this is really, as we um, develop Project JACE, which is the hands-free component, which really still focuses on physical infrastructure, um, the bulk of our research in 2018, as, as opposed to the development on the application, our research is now going to start going into um, intellectual disabilities and really that soft in infrastructure that uh, we don't have um, really the same tools to diagnose with as for now. Can you turn on your microphone, please? I would say I, I really want to commend you for um, actually thinking holistically of all the accessibility because a lot of times we do, sometimes we, we, we begin to create silo-based solutions. And the way I understand it that you are leveraging your uh, crowdsourcing platform and knowledge and experience now for 10 years, and but you're really trying to tackle the entire disability disciplines from a different angle, which is very commendable. <laughs> Thank you. Dimitri, did you also have a comment or thought that you wanted to share? Do you have competitors that develop similar product or you are alone on the market? For us, uh, we don't really have um, competitors, as you might say, but we have people who are also collaborating on this data, and our approach is to get a more holistic um, understanding of the data, because we have so many places that say, again, we're accessible, but what does that mean? What does that not include? So for us, uh, collecting qualitative data has been the most uh, important part of our mission, so that we understand, hey, we have a wheelchair ramp, but the lights are really bright. So if we understand that, then we can say, okay, this is accessible for people in this way and this way. Thank you all so much. Our time is up. Um, thank you to our presenters with their wonderful solutions. Thank you to our business leaders and their input and thoughts. Um, I'm sure the conversations will continue. Remember to fill out your feedback sheets if you have any input, thoughts, advice, want to collaborate, and give it to the initiatives directly or hand it in to me, and I'm happy to distribute it. We will start with the next session that will be another round of interesting presentations and feedback in about seven minutes. See you later. Welcome everyone to this session. We're slowly starting while we're still waiting for our presenters to come back, but uh, maybe you want to put yourself already in, 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 in sort of the mood for this to start. Yeah. 
don't leave as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, the other one's left as well. So, we're, we're, we're changing the setup of the session. <laughs> All our speakers have left. <laughs> no, I am joking, I'm joking. Look, look, he's out there chatting. Come. <laughs> okay, a very warm welcome for me. My name is Mario Ringler. I am with an organization called Ashoka. I'm our Ashoka Europe leader, and our wonderful friends and colleagues from Israel are bringing in some festive mood and uh, less uh, time structure than I'm supposed to uh, be uh, whipping here, which is uh, wonderful because it shows us that we live in a world where we have very different ideas of time needs, impact, culture, and uh, how to actually enjoy life. So I think that uh, we should celebrate that. Anyway, we're here not only to uh, philosophize about intercultural differences, but actually to talk about really wonderful and interesting innovations in the field of IT and accessibility. And if you were part of the last session, uh, you know that I'm a very strict timekeeper. Um, and that the purpose of this session really is to uh, present three different innovations in this field. And then uh, the Zero Project Conference has invited four leaders in the field of um, impact investing and also uh, foundations and people with a business angel background to give feedback, advice, input, and ask questions. Because we're so many people here in this room, it is very hard for us to have everyone speak, which is why we are distributing something that we call feedback cards. So if you feel like also giving input, ask questions, consult, uh, you know, in any way collaborate or show your interest, then these cards are one way of doing this. The other way, of course, is to approach people directly. Um, but this is meant as a very sort of earnest attempt at involving everyone in this and making this an, as interactive as possible. Let me quickly introduce uh, our, as we call them, panelists to you. Yong Chin Choi is uh, working with Fineo on around impact investing practices since 2015. He uh, is uh, especially focused on technology for social good and has a background as a corporate venture capital unit investment manager with 3M. Welcome. Yes, you may clap. Martin Vogelsang is the Germany country representative of the European Venture Philanthropy Association that is building ecosystems for impact investing um, and has also uh, worked in the sector of social startups and social enterprises in India and um, is currently still the managing partner of Social Synergy. Welcome Martin, thank you for being here. And then we have, uh, and I'm realizing in terms of the gender setup, we could have done a bit more of a mix uh, here. Uh, we have Selma Prodanovic, who is uh, a really well-known entrepreneur, angel investor, and one of the leading figures of that sector here in Austria and in Europe. Selma, thank you for being here. And Katharina Turnauer, who is the uh, founder and CEO of the Vienna-based Katharina Turnauer Privatstiftung, private foundation, um, and also uh, the president of Sinnstifter, a really important driving force for philanthropy in Austria, and she's definitely uh, the voice of that in many wonderful ways. Thank you all for being here. And we have three innovations that will be presented to you in five minute pitches and then we'll go around and ask panelists for their thoughts, input, feedback, questions, um, and uh, hopefully make this as productive and interesting for everyone as possible. And I would like to start with uh, Make Sense and uh, 
presentation. Yes, David, welcome. Please tell us all about your work. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Adi, and I'm the founder and the CEO of Make Sense, an Israeli-based company. Actually, uh, how will you move this like, forward? Ah, you have a clicker here. Okay. Sorry about that. So I want to start uh, my presentation with a short scenario, short story about Donald. I want to introduce you. Donald, it's uh, a guy that suffers from access, some disability. Um, you know, over one billion people around the world today actually need some assistance regarding accessibility or disabilities that they suffer. And they want to, to use the websites, web platform, as usual as any other person. Donald's arrived to a, a website, an e-commerce website. He wants to purchase something, like everybody else is doing. However, in that specific uh, website, from some reason, even that the websites invest a lot of time and effort in order to be accessible, it might be that they miss something, some glitch happened. And Donald's is frustrated. He cannot purchase this product that he wants. The reason is he hit exactly this, in this specific uh, scenario, the, the issue that he prevent him to move forward, to continue. So from Donald's, he's frustrated and it's uh, normal. But from the other side, the e-commerce actually lose a customer. They lose, they lose money. This is exactly what makes sense actually try to figure out. We develop a platform that in a single line of code that embedded in the e-commerce website and using the wisdom of the crowd, meaning every one of us that using these websites, we actually figure out things and issues, accessibility issues, that included in these websites and notified back to a sophisticated dashboard that actually give to the web owner of, the, of this e-commerce website fully picture about which kind of accessibility issues the website suffer from, how to fix it, and how to make it much more agile and faster to remediate so Donalds and friends like Donalds will not be prevent to use the websites and to uh, be limited by purchases. The idea here is actually to deal with the, ma the major issue with accessibility maintenance. Most of the audit today happen manually. This is an issue. Because manually, because we are human beings, we are limited in the number of the amounts of data that we can manage, handle. Imagine websites or web platform with millions of pages. It's impossible to scan all the pages. It's impossible to find all the accessibility issues. So we actually do just survey. And this survey actually creates a glitch, as I mentioned before. Think also about situation that we found the issue and we supply the information to the R&D department. It's take a while till they fix the issue. But now everything good, everybody happy because they fix it. However, new issues pop up. And then it's postponed and postponed, meaning the web platform outside will never be accessible as needed. This is the main uh, challenge in web platform accessibility in digital content accessibility. So <clears throat> what we supply, and that's actually the target of MakeSense, it's not only to audit and to notify where are the issues. It's also to, su to supply a very simple tools that to be fixed the web platform and remediate the accessibility issues for the short term very, very fast. So in the meantime, other users that use the, the platform or the next people that come after Donalds can use the websites in an accurate way and to increase the revenue for the websites but also the feeling of satisfaction to use the website as anybody else. So we know that we combine between the short-term fixing to the long-term fixing. Everybody speak about only for the long-term to use it in the source code. We agree with them. So we supply instruction for developers to teach them to know how, how to deal with accessibility, what they need to do in order to solve. Because they might, might be the best developers, but accessibility is not in their main focus. 
And that's everything done in our platform. So our mission in the end is to supply equal opportunity to everybody in digital content now. They don't need to wait anymore. And how we do it? Single line of code embedded very easily in any web platform. It's a client side. We are the only one that's secure by ISO 27001 information security certification because it's important by cyber wall and hacking that the site will be protected also. This is a very major issue also for government, cities, etc. The single line of code embedded a menu that the end users can set his preference how he wants to use the website or which assistant he needs and the dashboard supplied to the owner of the website, the specific elements, the locations, and the remediation tools to fix their websites. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly in the end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Who wants to go first with thoughts, inputs, questions? Martin, please. Um, could you explain a little more detail on which stage Can you, you are? stay with the microphone? Because otherwise it's very hard to hear. Um, if you could explain a little more in a little more detail in which stage your enterprise is, whether you're in early stage or in the replication phase, and how do you, do you measure the social impact mm -hmm. of your enterprise? Thank you. Do a second question. Young, Young Jin, you, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just uh, wondering um, how, how big the problem uh, actually is then. So how many Donalds are there? on average, so how, how big is the pain also for the website owners? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we established in January 2016 in Israel. We hold more than 50% of the Israeli market. The Israeli government, the biggest banks, the telco, uh, the enterprise actually using our service. Uh, we established a subsidiary in the United States a uh, few months ago. I am personally moved to live in the United States uh, from Israel in order to manage the operation in the United States. Uh, we, our business model is using a business partner, meaning to use channels to approach to their markets because you know, different languages, different cultures, as you mentioned before also, uh, it actually gives challenge to organizations and small companies like us. So we, I prefer to do it fast. And my main target is to create, to, to convert the accessibility departments in different organizations from cost center to a profit center. Meaning that organizations, even huge ones like Amazon, eBay, uh, Microsoft, Google, need to make money from accessibility, not because they're greedy, because in that way they will push accessibility. So that's the reason why we design the, the, our solution as a platform. So it will be easy to implement in any kind of solution. That's the reason why we go to architecture that it's a client side. So it can be overlay with a virtual layer above any platform. So it will be easy to use, easy to train, easy to give the capabilities to end users. But anyhow, accessibility, it's an area that is challenging by VC's approach and other approach. Meantime, we sell funding ourselves from our profits and uh, revenues, but definitely we will be looking for investors or uh, uh, VCs that will be ready to take us to the next steps. We truly believe that we are one of the pioneers in this area and we can bring the, the message forward much more faster. So uh, regarding your questions, how it, it's pain. So, we, after we established the solution in Israel, we got a very good feedbacks from the Israeli markets, from end users that told us that once we do that, we give them the equal opportunity to use websites in a way that they want or they can't use it uh, in order to achieve what they need. Uh, we also have one patent in the documents area because we create a technology that converts any documents to be an HTML file and to be accessible automatically. And we also got funds recently from the Israel Innovation Authority in Israel. Um, so the pain it exists, uh, the needs is exist. I think that this business, it's kind of uh, infinity. Just imagine the number of websites. Uh, I mean, if you want to answer the have. other questions. Yeah, sure, sorry about that. I have to be strict. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Katerina. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, what are the biggest um, challenges you face? Uh, hold on. Selma, do you answer? I would like just to um, 
I was confused at the very beginning because you started with the client at the end, so the end, end user. But obviously, your business is based on your clients or companies. Or so I would say, in terms of the presentation, you might want to to think about that how you do that, uh, because I lost you in one moment. Where are you heading? Um, but especially uh, in terms of your how do you get your clients and do they really see you as the solution for them? to reach more, how much more business do you provide them? I mean, what is the business model? How much does it cost and what do I get at the end of the day? You have one more, qu one more minute to answer. Very fast answer. So the, the, the challenge, sorry, the challenge that uh, we have, it's first education. Organization doesn't know that in some cases they need to do it by regulation. And also, they don't understand the benefits that the websites or web platform they will be accessible. Uh, they think so, in some places uh, they seem like it's a duty that they don't like to do because it costs them money. Uh, however, we create a blog that we create for them some articles that show them how it's impact their businesses and how it can improve uh, their solution. I think that the things that Google doing with the search engines and the decisions that websites that not accessible be actually impacting the rank, it give us a backwind. However, it's not enough. Uh, the knowledge need to be known. That's it's the main challenge. The, the explanation. Uh, for your questions, I. I Make sense, have four products. One is for the end users. We have a Chrome extension that gives it to accessible any websites on demand. It's the same technology, but we do it for uh, external uh, browsers. And also the business model, it's working with uh, channels. What it means that accessibility consulting firms can supply better service because it will be much more faster. To, to ask for their customers to pay for them, but give them faster solution. Also to remediate automatically and faster uh, websites. Also to train and to give the capabilities of know-how. For the professional services, our resellers and our channel partners make all the money and all the revenue and keep it. It's only for them. We are not charge anything. We charge only for the licenses. The, I was just trying to say that if you can show that there is a need and that they make more business, they make more profits, and make an impact, it will be easier for you to sell the, the whole story. That's all what I want to say. I, I agree with you absolutely, and that's what we try to, to achieve. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, for everybody. For your presentation. Our next presenter is Or Cohen, who is the Director of Business Development and Marketing at STEP here. Good afternoon uh, for everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Or uh, from uh, Step Here. Um, I promised Marie that I will be on time, uh, and we have a very, very short time. My main disability is to be on time, so I really do my best in order to to complete this mission. Um, so let's just get to the point. Um, when we started seven years ago, Step Here as a system, we trying to understand what is the biggest challenges we're facing through. Here you see a person with an eyesight disability, a visual impaired person, that is just crossing from his home in order to get to the basic services, either through a bank, public tra transportation, uh, crossing through the street, and so on. In Step Here, we're trying to do our best in order to allow this person enabling an accessible environment as much as possible. And um, how we do so? Originally, um, the, the, the system was based on an app that allowed navigation and orientation for people with an eyesight disability. But in the last two years, we also developed another few features that allow this person also to uh, navigate and also control different systems and features, like, for example, call for assistance, uh, gates and doors opener, traffic light audio, uh, also in the public transportation, communication with the driver himself, and uh, basically a lot of features that involve with audio science. Um, when we thought about our main principles and our main uh, targets, uh, we thought about, first of all, being in contact with the community. I think that you cannot make um, a system that is accessible for people with disabilities without the connection to the community. Uh, one very, very good example for that is that uh, the chief of our development team is a blind person named Shmulek, an amazing person that is 
basically every day com com communicating with the uh, community itself. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group of over 100 users that give us feedback all the time how to get better and how to be more precise about the needs of people with uh, disabilities. Simplicity, we're trying to do the system, the app, as much simple possibly can. I think that when we're talking about accessibility, simplicity is a pa part of the point. And experience, uh, also our parent company uh, called Mealev have around 20 years of experience in the field of accessibility. And I think it's inspiring us quite a lot in that uh, matter. So what actually, how does it work and what actually we're doing? Uh, we have an app that's just transmitting uh, through a cloud, um, either to an audio sign or either to a beacon, and allows either information or either um, calling for assistance for a person with an eyesight disability. And also in the app, we, there, there is in the last year some kind of a compass that allows 360 degrees of or orientation, a speed dial for assistance, and of course a link for accessible web page in order to allow the person to get all the information he needs. And one of the more interesting projects we did in the last year is uh, some kind of a pilot with the um, Office of uh, the Israeli Office of Transportation uh, that allows a person to arrive to the bus stop, uh, getting all the information he needs either through the speaker or either through the app, and transmitting a message to the bus driver that just gives him a message pay attention, there is a person with a disability waiting for you at the bus station. Uh, it's a pilot that now is uh, in two stations in Israel, and in the next year we're probably going to do it in some other more places. And another thing that we added in the last year is something called Call Ear, and that is an application that was based on a premier system that we had, that allows some kind of uh, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, like uh, um, opening gates, like uh, operating wheelchair lift and uh, etc and in the last 30 seconds that I had uh, if you can switch on the play um, we produced especially for uh, this conference a short video clip let's see how much time we'll have to present it but I think probably it's worth even more than 1,000 words and um, just how does it look like and how is it working from the eyesight of uh, a person with disability yeah you can switch it on please Four button. Oh, call for in call open door. Button open door. Welcome to Bank Yahav. In front of you is the ATM. In order to get to the address of the bank, walk two steps to the left. For more information, please press button number two. system I was speaking about, that also can help more than people with an eyesight disability. You arrive to Sokolov Street at Cholon. In front of you, there is the pedestrian crossing. Open door. Button. Open door. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Selma, I see you have questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, yes, th tons of questions, but we'll, uh, we have a short time. So um, the question is first, what is it what you, 
what you're doing? Do you have an app, or do you have an app and a ha hardware that you're selling? I'm, I'm not sure I understood that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, are you selling, or you know, are you making money with that? How, what kind of business is that? And third, how do you feed the information? I'm not sure I understood that. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go next? Katerina, do you want to go next, or Martin? Um, you mentioned that you had a that there was a parent company with 20 years of experience in mm -hmm. accessibility. What is the relationship? Um, does this parent company treat you kind of like a CSR project, or are you a subdivision that could be spun out in the future and become an entity of its own? Mm -hmm. uh, so first, I will answer your question. Um, basically, there is a cloud that all the information is installed in there and the information itself is transferred from the cloud into the um, transmitter into the either the beacon or either the audio sign uh, there is a possibility for the user to choose if he's getting the information itself to hearing it through the app or to get it through the audio sign the reason we wanted to allow this person the both possibilities is because in some places if this person wants to get to a specific point, it will be easier for him if there will be some kind of a sound. For example, an ATM, if you have the speaker near the ATM, you can get exactly where is the ATM located at. Did I answer your question? Yeah. And, sorry? And uh, about uh, your question, uh, we are a separate company today and um, we are uh, profitable. Like, uh, there is today in Israel around um, more than 1,000 systems that are installed all over Israel. We have also several um, systems that are installed in Turkey, in uh, Sweden, and uh, in the next year also a couple of the more systems will be installed in France and in South Africa. Yeah. I'm going to ask the question again. What is the business case behind and how are you funded up till now? Uh, so the business case uh, is funded, first of all, the app is free, free of charge, of course, for the users. Um, the business model is based on the companies or the organizations that want to make their facilities much more accessible. So in Israel, for example, there is the, reg the regulation that uh, requires some kind of accessibility for people with a uh, visually impaired or eyesight disability. Uh, I can tell you that one of the things that we are recognizing in the moment from demanding from the world is the matter of public transportation, that the funding for, for that is from the, um, either the Office of Transportation in the countries that approach us or other, uh, some kind of a specific or private fund. But basically, the business model is based only on the companies or organizations that we are installing the system at their facilities. Mm -hmm. Young Chin, did you have questions? Input, feedback, thoughts? I was just wondering about the, the size of the addressable market, you know, whether it's really significant and how maybe it could, be, could it be expanded if, um, if, uh, if you have you know, people without disabilities could benefit in any way from it, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I can really... So I can stop. Yeah, I can um, really relate to, to what you're saying. Uh, one of the um, strategic things we're thinking about for the future is to extend this app also for people that are not necessarily people with disabilities. Uh, I can tell you that uh, today we have also some kind of a demanding uh, to customize the system also for people with the mobility disability. Uh, the idea, for example, for uh, the um, uh, wheelchair elevator was based on a user, on a private user that said come to my home let's start to let's try to connect the app uh, into the uh, wheelchair lift uh, so I think the in potential matter I think there is quite a big potential also to customize the system for more than only people with disabilities yeah. Just a, so many uh, questions, wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But going back to the questions I asked, how do you feed the information? That means that basically you sell the, 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 uh, the whole, your product, your service to mm -hmm. a company, let's say a bank, mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, and they feed you with the information that is needed for the for, for the users. Is that correct? Exactly. First of all, our system it, it is you said about the bank. So today, all the big big banks in Israel have this system. Uh, also in the entrance of the bank, also inside the bank itself, also in the ATM, uh, they are telling us what information to put on. Uh, it's, a it's a lot of a matter of uh, flexibility and customization and also in the, in the side of the users, on the needs of the users, but also of course in the needs of the organization itself, of course. Which means that basically your product is not scalable as such, it has to be adapted, always customized to the specific space client that you're selling to. Absolutely, okay. all the time. For example, uh, the speaker itself allows also the user or the, the logistic people from the bank also to record whatever information they want. And the information that is on the cloud is um, put in by, by our help, but eventually, yeah, we, we can customize it to whatever we want. Yeah. Thank you very much, Or. Thank you. Bye bye. full service here. Uh, <laughs> and, we, <laughs> and with that, we're coming to Oliver Drehmann, who is an entrepreneur with background in banking and computer science and is talking about simplicity. Oops. Good afternoon. Thanks to Boas from Project where I can switch some of my slides because we have a very overlapping uh, topic. I agree with you, you have just mentioned, 20% of the people have been left alone using a mobile phone because they have disabilities. 80% of those are elderly people, 50 years and older. We have loss of sight, we have hearing loss, but we will be also addressed with our solution is the loss of sense of touch, touch and the difficulty to, to to deal with complex situations because you are maybe a hit in the old, when you get older with dementia. Those all affect the mobile phone. The phones that we have today doesn't address this. If you take a smartphone and if you want to type, type a uh, text message, using your fingers, close your eyes or you're blind, you know about the problem, try to text. It's not possible. You don't have a tactile feedback from your keyboard that is a virtual keyboard on the, on the phone. We think this is not the solution that the customer needs. Smartphones are also sometimes too complex, they're expensive, and actually they have a short run time. They last usually on the battery just a day. That's why we came up with a simple solution, something that is very easy. It's a feature phone with a real keyboard. We're going back to the roots, as the former days when we had the first phones. It has large tactile buttons addressing the peoples with the, the loss of sense. It is fully voice guided. Fully voice guided means everything you do on the phone is being actually spoken. What you see on the screen is being spoken. If you navigate through the, nav through the menu, it's spoken. If you put in a character, it's spoken. If you delete it, it's spoken. It speaks every word, sentence, and even this whole text. It has a non-touch display, a huge display, not huge compared to a smartphone, but to a feature phone. It has an ergonomic shape, size, and weight for those that have tactile problems. It lasts long on a battery. We have reached up to 60 days if we switch off the LCD, 20 days in normal use. It has a SOS alarm function, and it comes at a reasonable price. I think it's a simple solution that actually absolutely fits the needs of those 20% left over. You think it's tribal? Yes, it's tribal, but there's no solution or market that offering something like that. We have sold so far 25,000 phones of a, suck, a predecessor phone, and we have the feedback from our customers. We asked our customers what we can actually improve on the solution. All what they said is not adding function. Unisono, they said, keep it simple. Simplicity, simplicity is key, absolutely. That's why we have actually focused only on four major essential functions. Contact management, taking and placing calls, taking and writing and receiving and reading messages, and setting alarms. And that's it. There's no browser, there's no internet, there's nothing that is complex. What we have added, some convenience functions on top is a sound boost for hearing aids, a speed dial, and a hands-free mode, 
a status report telling you what the phone is, is it connected to network or not, what is the battery level, and the talking watch. As we know that some people have a talking watch extra, they can have it with the phone. In general, it's a just standard phone. It has 2G, 3G. It comes in two versions for the US market and for the rest of the world. It has an FM radio as a gadget. It has a text-to-speech, up to 50 different languages we can implement. We have five to seven languages, depending on the language size, uh, on the phone, on a 7 gigabyte onboard memory. We have an SD card slot you can enhance. You can even add more, more languages. We have a huge battery for, for a feature phone that allows, uh, allows up to, uh, to have up to the 60 days uh, on, on uh, autonomy. And we have a weight for 150 grams. The whole thing is one platform. We have developed everything on our own in Switzerland. We have a concept, separate modem, processors, and software, everything done at our own completely, a platform that allows us to develop the, f the product to the next stage. If it's needed to add a frequency, we can add, we can add the, enhance the, the application, we can get more power to the phone whenever we want. In the moment, we're manufacturing as I speak. We will ramp up the phone in the next three to four months and then roll out to new markets that we have not addressed so far. So far we support seven languages in 14 countries and have a network of 40 resellers where we have sold the previous version of the phone. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Oliver. <laughs> you. Martin has questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have several questions, but I will probably just stay with one or two. Um, first question, of course, is you're producing a hardware product. Um, what is your um, perspective when it comes to the size of the market? And in, you said this product has been developed to 95% up to now. 95%, yes. We are, at the moment, we are producing. Okay. So um, what is your perspective looking forward in the next five years, six years? and when do you expect to become self-sustainable? Okay, we're going to collect questions. Selma, do you want to go next? <laughs> question. Uh, first question. Why can I not just simply use Siri or Alexa or anything else? That was the first thought that I had with that. But you said that you sold already 25,000 products, but yeah. you're still developing. I'm not sure I understand how does that okay. work. And third, I'd imagine that the price would be the reason why would people buy that in comparison to buying a smartphone with voice that you can use and where you wouldn't need to comment on that. Okay. I, I start with your questions. Um, actually, the Siri, yes, you can use Siri. I mentioned also the people that have mental problems uh, by dementia. The older they get, the, easier, the more difficult for them is to access a complex solution. And we have seen our customers, even if they have a smartphone before, they're looking for something simpler, simplicity. And Siri doesn't allow you to text and, and complete text message. If you want to edit it, to be honest, you can, write a you can speak a sentence, it will take the sentence and will send out, but to edit the text, difficult. And actually, if you're in a, in a bus and you want to write a message and nobody wants to, to actually be part, part of that, difficult. So we have customers that were just uh, like, they like to have this actually as an as a old Nokia-like input style, giving this, the possibility over the earphone to, to text a message without any sharing with anybody. It's the one thing. Um, I forgot the other question, sorry for the... Sorry. You said that you sold already 25,000 products, 20, yeah. but you're still produ so yeah. wasn't there was There was a company before I have been actually involved into that went bankrupt. I, I felt so in love with this product idea and with the clientele and the service that I thought, I won't, don't want to see this die. That's why I have restarted my own company, have started from scratch with the knowledge, all of the 25,000 phones sold and the feedback given by that, and just as a new company, we started with a new product but with the experience of the old one. Addressing the market size, yes, we have sold so far in the old product in 14 countries. Um, the market is huge. To be honest, we have never been able to sell to, uh, to sell as we should and could. Uh, we see we have sold 25,000 units in two years. I have 
on my table in a moment offers uh, requests for about 50,000 for the first year. The market, even in the, the seven countries that we have, 13 countries that we are serving so far, I guess that we can sell up to 50,000 units a year. And this is a product actually that you sell every time time. It's, it's actually even lasting four years, but the people need another one after, after a couple of time. So the market is immense. Just one brief question. I don't know if you already mentioned it. What is the price per unit? It's about 300. 300. Okay. 300 dollars, Swiss franc, euros. Um. I have um, a comment to make. What is the difference um, of a normal startup? What would be the social mission in that? Um, if I look at, at that concept, which I think is great because it, it, it's a niche product which is very much needed, but if I'm really honest, I would call this more a startup than a social startup. I have been in startups before, they have, done, they have been focused only on, uh, on profit. This has five years of blood and pain and, and sweat in there. We, like, we really, we, we really focus to the like clientele. any other startup has blood and tears and sweat for many years. But we focus definitely on those people with needs, and we are addressing this in in all means. So the the idea is actually to give them the best solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Young team, you had a question. So you mentioned you had a, a similar startup before. So what is the key learning that you had to take away, and? Um, the other comment I would like to make, the price point is, seems to be relatively high, so I could imagine that you could, uh, someone else maybe could develop a similar product but produce it at a much lower cost. Yes. So. Sorry. Yes, you could actually develop maybe on a lower cost if you have a, a larger uh, number of phones that you sell per year. To be honest, we start on a low level. The problem is actually the numbers that we sell. If we would can be able to sell one million of, of, uh, of the phones a year, you get totally different price points that we get in a moment, because we have to buy in the hardware. The hardware is the problem. It's not this, it's not the, it's not the margin that we're taking. It's the hardware costs. And if we increasing the number, the price might come down. Sorry. The learning. I fully underestimated what it means to develop a hardware, a mobile phone hardware, at our own. Um, I'm not sure if I would do it again in the way that we did. We might use a reverence design, even with the, with the uh, impacts that it has and restrictions, we would better run with a reverence design to get closer to the market in, more, in, in earlier times, and then take the profit and then go for the second step, as we've done. We have taken too long for that. People are waiting. We are lucky. Nobody has actually stepped into the niche so far. There's no solution. We know that. And, but we are so close now, it's, it's a lesson learned, next time better. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, please remember that you have feedback sheets on your table that you can fill out and hand in to the uh, presenters or you can just approach them and have conversations. This is the end of our session. It was wonderful to have you here. and. Uh, I look forward to many interesting conversations in the break. Thank you very much.